Sandeep, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I uh, wanted to get your sense of uh, how things are coming along in the uh, outsourcing world these days. Uh, as we know, the world has been through uh, a financial crisis and an economic crisis. Uh, how did that affect the outsourcing business and where are the opportunities these days? I think the outsourcing business uh, has had a paradoxical uh, relationship with the economic uh, crisis. Uh, a lot of the large firms which were outsourcing, uh, some of them went into trouble, talking particularly of the Bear Stearns of the world, etc. So obviously the outsourcing they did uh, got affected. But what happened as a result of the crisis was people obviously looked at their balance sheets and said, hey, we need to you know, make us more efficient, reduce costs. And a lot of firms who were not outsourcing or at the very early stages looked at both outsourcing and offshoring. So a lot of companies who were not in the outsourcing paradigm came into the outsourcing. So that was one. The other thing is companies like us have globalized. So we are today in multiple countries and multiple geographies. And uh, what we've now realized is that, uh, so we are very big in India, and the Indian economy still grew in spite of the, uh, the economic crisis. We are big, in, uh, for example, in South Africa, which saw growth. That helps you kind of uh, you know, mitigate your risks. Uh, so the U.S. is not just the only player in the market. So I saw two trends. One was of companies which were not very much outsourcing, being either forced to outsource or thinking of outsourcing or embracing that paradigm. And one is that if you are completely d diverse, then you have different markets which are growing at different levels. So overall, I think, uh, uh, you know, we didn't do that badly. The industry uh, didn't have the kind of growth that it had in 2007. But I think 2010, uh, you will see much more robust growth for the industry also. Can you give me a greater sense of Aegis's operations and the kinds of verticals in which you are active? Sure. And again, where do you see the opportunities going forward? So Aegis is uh, today uh, one of the, you know, one of the paradigms we said is we've got to be global in the global sense of the word. So we have, you know, we kind of follow the sun as we call it. So we have operations in Australia, we have operations in Philippines, we have India and Sri Lanka. Uh, in Africa, we have South Africa and Kenya. Uh, we have in the U.S. and then we have in Central America. Uh, we have about 40,000 people uh, in all these locations. Uh, a primary paradigm is what we call the customer lifecycle management. So from the time the customer comes into the system to managing him, to customer service, to customer retention, to collections, to customer an data analysis, so we, we do there. And within this paradigm of customer lifecycle analysis, we are uh, doing a lot of work for telecom, financial service, healthcare, and travel and entertainment. So those are really the big verticals. I think there is uh, growth in each of these sectors. Telecom is booming in most of the world, in India and Africa. Uh, financial services is something which is growing uh, everywhere. And even in the US, there is a greater propensity to outsource financial services, again, because of cost and efficiency play. Uh, healthcare, I mean, there's a huge, you know, with 32 pe million people who are going to get insurance over the next 10 years, there's a huge scope. So for us, the scope is going global. Uh, frankly, uh, our, our, our motto has been by saying wherever there is economic commerce between people, you need uh, BPO. So our aim is to be at 195 countries. Uh, we're currently at 15, uh, theoretically at least, and we are moving. So we see scope in new geographies. And each of these markets, we see a huge scope as we go forward. That's interesting. Can you give me an example, say, in the telecom space of the kind of uh, jobs that are coming your way, and how do you compete with, you know, some of the more uh, 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 the, the larger outsourcing companies uh, that that have been, uh, you know, perhaps uh, building their brands in this space for a long time? I think in telecom, uh, uh, we've been doing this for a fair bit of time, uh, both in the U.S. in Australia and UK and in India. I think we, again, on the customer life cycle, we do the entire bit. We do a lot of customer acquisition through a variety of ways, whether it is voice or email or direct mail. We do customer support. Uh, we do tech support. We do a lot of back office. So tomorrow, if you want to say, hey, I need a cell phone connection, let's say a prepaid connection, then there is a lot of activation we need to be done before your cell phone starts working or you're activating the system. So we do all of that uh, work. Uh, we then do uh, collections. 
uh, we do customer retention. So again, uh, you know, we do we do the entire process, uh, uh, you know, for for telecom. Uh, the other question that you asked, I think, in a lot of countries like India, we have a huge recognition. I think in 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 the U.S. and we are a we are a multinational company, but we are based in India and we're Indian owned. But we have five thousand people in the U.S. and that's something I think we've got to build the brand a little more. Let people know that listen, this is a forty thousand people company. And a company which has 5,000 people in the U.S., which really even the big IT majors like an Infosys or a Wipro will not have. So, yes, I think it's a little bit of brand recognition and brand building uh, that we also uh, need to do. How, how are you going about building your brand? I think in a variety of ways. Uh, one is to look at uh, industry formats. So recently there was the International Association of Outsourcing in Florida. So we were very prominent there. The IAOP, as we said, we take part in a lot of uh, niche industry events like the healthcare, we took part in a couple of conferences, telecom, uh, collections, debt, and that's number two. Third, what we are doing is we are also trying to, uh, uh, you know, look at it. We, 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 we spoke at a Frost & Sullivan conference I spoke. We're very big with NASCOM. We try to do a collaboration between NASCOM and here in the U.S. So primarily using industry forums, industry bodies, trade uh, exhibitions, and of course, uh, being present, say, at a school of learning like Wharton, are all part of helping to build the brand. Uh, well, uh, uh, one of the points that was made uh, during an earlier session at the Wharton India Economic Forum is that in the BPO space, uh, it's very clear that the, the, the emerging trend is no longer related to uh, labor arbitrage, uh, you know, or a race to a bottom for the lowest prices. Uh, that much more the competitive advantage is shifting towards value-added services. Uh, and, and building greater value through providing you know, new, new and innovative services to clients. Uh, to what degree do you see that happening in your portfolio of services, and can you give us any examples? So I think I would uh, say, you know, this value-added uh, services is a bit of a cliche. Uh, I think the, the, the trick is to do both. Today what has happened, and you're absolutely right, uh, you know, the, the lowest cost is is not just the value proposition, and in fact, India is not low cost anymore. There are countries which are uh, low cost than India. But I think there's a market for doing a kind of work where you get huge economies of scale, there are good margins in the business. And what we've done in India to keep the cost advantage, for example, move from a tier one city to a tier two city, which is a huge cost advantage to see that we, we have a cost advantage. And I think that's a, that's a business, and that's a pro so you know we, there's no good or bad business. It's a business. Is it profitable? Does it make sense? But having said that, it's important to have a much more holistic relationship with the customer, and therefore you need to do much more than what you're doing. So just to give you an example, in all these processes, uh, let's say let's do something. Let's say in the financial services sector, we started with customer support and voice, but now we do processing. So we do claims processing. Uh, we do, uh, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, medical coding, medical billing. So you, you know, once you've been engaging with the customer, you've got a foot in the door by maybe which is not the highest value, but that allows you to work with the customer, understanding his process, understanding his business. You can then do much more of that business. So if you look at us, we started as a call center. Uh, five years back, 100% of a business call center. Today it is less than, it's about 65%. 35% of it is back office, processing, data analytics, which we started to do. And I think, so I think not to completely ignore, I mean, you can make a nano and a Jaguar is our philosophy. Uh, so you keep doing that, do it, at, do it at the right cost, get the right margin, but with your new existing customers, new customers, give them a variety of services so that you have a holistic relationship with them, so that you have a relationship at multiple points, and that makes the business more sticky at the end. You, know, you raised a very interesting point about managing your costs by moving to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving away from tier one cities to two, uh, two, two cities, uh, and also the fact that uh, the outsourcing business India is no longer the the low cost provider. And, uh, do you have the skills as you move from say one center to the other? Do you find enough people with the kind of skills that are needed to do the kind of work you do? And also globally. Which are the emerging centers for BPO and, uh, that, that offer the kind of value, uh, best value for uh, money? And what does this mean for India as a competitive uh, source of advantage? 
So I think, uh, yes, it's impo- uh, you know, you need to choose the right centers. Uh, in some of our centers for very specialized work, we've taken people from outside who come and, uh, you know, who stay there. So, uh, for example, uh, we wanted, uh, you know, we do some work uh, for French speaking uh, for some European company. Now, you know, and, we, and then we realize whether we do it in a Bangalore or, say, a smaller city like Mysore, it's still difficult to get the same guy. So we've got a lot of people from the Ivory Coast, which is a French-speaking nation, and they speak French. So we said it doesn't matter whether we relocate them to Bangalore or, Ma- or Mysore, but Mysore is cheaper for us. And so you need to do a little bit of management, but you need to choose the right city. So there, there are low-cost cities which have good universities. So two in the south, I'm, I'm mentioning a couple of cities like Mysore and Mangalore, good university systems, you get students. Uh, so that, 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 is, that is something that you have to choose and clearly do. The other thing is, uh, uh, you know, uh, countries like, uh, let us say, uh, Sri Lanka, countries like Vietnam, countries like Kenya, countries like Ghana. So we have an operation in Kenya, uh, which is another low-cost country, uh, good affinity to the UK. Uh, we, we've just been exploring Ghana. Egypt, uh, you know, we've been looking at operations in Egypt. So uh, some of these are, uh, are markets uh, where there is, uh, which are other low-cost markets, uh, which can certainly uh, work with India and be a challenge to uh, the cost structure, at least in India. Uh, how serious is the policy challenge these days, uh, especially when governments start funding uh, businesses, which seems to have happened quite a bit uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Uh, politicians are always concerned about jobs. Uh, uh, has that made a, the policy environment any more difficult for BPO companies these days? So I think I think uh, there is there is there is a little bit of a challenge, but there is also a little bit of difference between rhetoric and reality. Uh, politicians of any stripe anywhere in the world are concerned with public opinion. And therefore, we need to be sensitive to it. But also, uh, companies, whether government-funded or otherwise, have to be profitable. So there are two kind of divergent strains of thought. So outsourcing has continued. But uh, we believe uh, also that, listen, if you are outso- uh, offshoring from the US, you should have a presence in that country. So we have grown our US presence. We believe there are certain kinds of jobs which have to be in the US because of security reasons, because of policy reasons. And uh, frankly, when in Rome, be like Romans. So our policy has been, yes, it will not fundamentally affect the shift to outsourcing, but we are sensitive. And we believe that if there is a country where there is a lot of business we are getting, say, in the U.S., just to give an example, we need to have a big presence in the U.S., and we need to see how to grow that presence. And that's what we are doing. Uh, Just one last question. If you were to look out over the next four to five years, uh, where do you see ages going and, uh, you know, where would you want to be? I think I see ages being more global. I think we want to be truly global uh, because for two things. One is there are opportunities in every market. And for us, one of the differences as opposed to other companies is we look at the local market in these countries. One of the reasons we've grown is that we are by far the largest call center in India and the largest BPO in India. So we've taken the Indian market. We are very big in the South African domestic market, and that's a growing market. So we see multiple geographies, A, to give a customer a choice, uh, say a U.S. customer, where he wants to be, number two, to grow the local market. Uh, So that's one thing we want to do. I think we've been growing in size. Uh, I think our choice has been to, even on a revenue number, to be over a billion dollars, not so much for the number per se, we are currently about 700 million, uh, because I think if you are large, if you have the scope and the size, then you get a seat at the table for any major outsourcing that happens. So I think that's really our scope, to be credible and large in size and to be truly global. Thank you so much for speaking with us. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you.